Good evening, folks. This is Simon Turpin of Answers in Genesis UK, and welcome to another one of our Friday night sessions. And tonight we're going to be looking at a really important topic, um, open air evangelism, sharing the gospel with people in the public arena. And this is something that many people in the church sadly don't do today. Um, and we're going to be discussing maybe some of the reasons why that is. But, you know, when you read the gospels, the gospel um, of Luke chapter 14 and verse 23. In that gospel, Jesus tells a parable and he tells people to go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in to the kingdom because the, the house needs to be filled. And we do need to do that today. I'm going to be talking about that in a minute with my guest, Joe Bailey. But if you've just got time, please do tell us where you're watching from tonight in the comments section um, below, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, Answers TV, please let us know where you're watching from. And if you take the time, please do like our Answers in Genesis YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it so you can keep up with all the content um, that we put on here. And just to let you know, um, next Saturday, um, we will be hosting a World Religions Conference. Only, sadly, here it's in the UK. You won't be able to come this if you're watching in other countries. But if you live near the area of Derbyshire in the UK, we're holding a World um, Religions and Cults Conference. You'll be able to get more information on the website or if you look in the comment section below where I'll be speaking, Professor Andy McIntosh will be speaking, my guest from last week, Tony Brown will be speaking, John Harris, who was with me a couple of weeks before that, and um, John C.P. Smith, C. P. Smith, who was with me a couple of weeks before that, we'll all be talking at that conference on different issues to do with world religions and cults. So if you're in the UK, please do try and get along to that event. But without any further ado, I'm going to invite my guest on tonight, uh, Joe Bailey from the Open Air Mission. Good evening, Simon. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem. It's good to have you on. Joe is a personal friend of mine. We go to the same church. In fact, Joe is an elder at Countess Thorpe Reformed Baptist Church here in Leicester. But Joe, rather than me tell people uh, about you, why don't you um, briefly tell people about yourself? Um, yeah, well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a worker with the Open Air Mission. So as Simon said, um, that's that's my full-time job. Um, I work in the, the Leicestershire and East Midlands area, going to different cities and preaching the gospel in the open air. Um, I'm married to Tammy um, and I've got two, uh, two, two girls and a boy on the way. And uh, it's uh, also we're, we're busy in, in the local church, as Simon said. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a bit about me. Great. So uh, we're going to be talking tonight, folks, about open air evangelism. As Joe said, he works for the open air mission. But Joe, why don't you tell us um, for people at least here in the UK and people from abroad, if they want to get in contact with you, they can tell us about the open air mission and some of the work you get up to? Well, um, Open Air Mission began quite a long time ago. It's not a, a new um, organization. It began in 1853. And it was the vision of a, of a man called John McGregor. Uh, John McGregor was a barrister. And he had a he had a burden for, for reaching the lost. And one day he was uh, he was walking through London and came across an open air meeting. And uh, in that meeting, he, he saw a preacher engaging a crowd of people and uh, there were many unchurched people standing and listening to the gospel. And uh, toward the end, John McGregor engaged with a Roman Catholic man and used his very sharp mind as a barrister to, to talk to him and, and felt there was real good done um, in, in, in reaching these people who would have never heard the gospel otherwise. And it really dawned on him that there was a need to uh, train and send men to preach the gospel in the open air. Um, because just like today, there were people doing open air work in 1853, but some who were doing it well and some who were doing it in ways which perhaps weren't so helpful. And so uh, John McGregor uh, set up the open air mission with a vision of, of, of training men, supporting the local church in and equipping them in, in doing winsome um, uh, gospel uh, evangelism on the streets. And uh, so that's how the open air mission began. And really, um, the open air mission hasn't deviated from that from that uh, vision at the beginning. Um, so today we have 11 uh, evangelists that are supported financially by the mission and 50 uh, associate workers who are uh, volunteers. They, they go out um, and are supported with uh, gospel leaflets and with uh, open air mission preaching boards, which we'll see later in some of the pictures. And what we do is we go to uh, the pedestrianized areas of the UK um, and we preach on the street. Um, we also run 
uh, team events. So um, here's a picture that's just come up. That's in Nottingham. That was today. And so the, the event, the uh, the evangelist will go to um, towns which are fairly local to them, preaching the gospel with a team from local churches. Uh, but then a, uh, a few times a year, we have team events where um, both evangelists and supporters um, go and camp out in a in a church and do a, a week of outreach or a few days of outreach in a particular place or city or event like a, a race or a, or a fairground or something like that. So th that's the, the, the thrust of the open air mission work. But what we really also want to do is support the local church in in, in doing open air evangelism. Uh, so we provide training um, when a local church is, is burdened to reach out in this way. Um, and we provide resources as well online and uh, and, and print resources. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the, the thrust of what the mission does. That's great. And folks, if you're watching tonight and you have a question you want to ask Joe about how open air evangelism works or maybe how you can get involved in it, um, wherever you're watching, then please do just type something in and we'll try and answer. And if not, we have a link um, to the open air mission and you can contact Joe uh, himself. But Joe, um, for, for practicality's sake, many people might be thinking, um, well, what do you do once you get out into the open air? How does open air preaching work? Do you just go out and stand in the middle of the street and start um, shouting Bible verses? How, do, how does it work pra practically? Um it's not perhaps what many people's vision of open air work is, depending on what you've uh, what you've seen of open air work. So um, there's three things I think we aim to be when we go out and preach the gospel in, in the open air. The first thing that we really want to be is engaging. We're not just there simply to dispense truth at people and then pack up and go home and pat ourselves on the back that we've deposited the truth in a particular part of a, of a city and uh, there we go, we've done our work. What we really uh, long, to, long to do is engage with people uh, and, and, and draw their attention to, to the gospel. And so um, what we do is we set up a, a board, a visual board where we can put on visual aids. And often we, we begin preaching with a talk that begins with a question, a question that, uh, that, 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 that tries to touch to something that people are thinking at the moment. So uh, that was that was in Nottingham today, as I said, and um, th I was preaching on the question, why doesn't God stop war? Um, something that is in people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on that topic, I was preaching about the fact that if we ask that question, we're assuming certain things already, that death and suffering that's produced by war is a is a is a bad thing, um, that evil exists, that uh, that life is precious and that God is powerful. You can't ask that question without assuming all those things. And so I went then on to talk about how, in fact, where do we find those truths? They're in the Bible. We're actually assuming the Bible is true when we ask that question. And then I point people to the gospel, how God is patient um, how how God uh, is speaking through these tragedies and circumstances, and also uh, God is 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 making peace through the blood has made peace through the blood of Christ, and so we want to engage with where people are rather than just dispense dispense truth at people. And so not only do we begin the open air with a question, but um, often in our preaching we're we're throwing questions out to to to, to those who are listening. We're, we're engaging them with eye contact. We want them to to be drawn in. Um, to listen to the gospel, and and something that we do that that I think perhaps helps towards that is is that we don't um, use an amp amplification. There are times when that's appropriate, but generally speaking, we we avoid amplification because what we want to do is draw people in. If people hear a very loud open air preacher in the distance, they think, well, I can hear what they're saying a hundred meters away, so there's no need to come near. But what we want to do is speak yes on an audible level, but draw people in. Um, to hear more about the gospel. And so the first thing that we try to do is, is be engaging. Um, something else that we want to do is be persuasive as well. So we, we try to, to have logical talks, logical open air messages that we work through, whether we're preaching from a text or having visual aids up on the board. Um, we want to, to lead people and reason with them and uh, and, and do that. So we, illustrations are a great help with that as well. Um, it's, it's, we can't preach in the open air without using both verbal illustrations and and uh, and pictorial illustrations. This is Roger, one of our associate workers, and uh, he's uh, he was preaching. He was just coming to the end of his message today, and this young young guy came up and and uh, engaged him and asked him a question. 
And having that visual aid with some scripture text, was Roger was able to, to talk him through the gospel mm -hmm. in a very simple way uh, to somebody who may have had no understanding of, of the gospel before. But th the third thing that we really want to be when we're out in the open air as well is, is we want to be convicting. Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict. But ultimately, every time we go out and preach, I'm very conscious that behind enemy lines in the hearts of people, we have allies so we know that God has given a conscience to every every person. Uh, we know that they have a knowledge of God. Romans 1.20 tells us that um, through creation. And so uh, the themes of, of conscience, of creation, of, of God speaking through providence. These are things that I'm often talking about in the open air because I know that people know these things are true. Yeah. And, um, and, and then I'll, I'll point them to the solution of a, of a guilty conscience in, in Christ. So we want we want. To, to preach the law of God um, and we want to uh, preach to those things that people know already and then build upon that with with biblical truth and, and with the gospel of Christ. So what we tend to do is if we work through our talk toward the end of the talk, what we'll do is if there's people listening is is encourage them to come forward and receive a gospel of John. So um, we have in the boards a, a few uh, John's gospels as well as other gospel literature and uh, this is at the end of a talk today. You see um, on the left there, there was three uh, teenage student girls who were listening as well as a, a sprinkling of other people. And, and we encourage them uh, once they've listened uh, to come and take a gospel of John and read more for themselves. And in the crowd, what we have also is a, a mix of, uh, of Christians from, from local churches who come and support the work. And they're looking out for those who've stopped and listened. And the purpose of that is that once that person either begins to walk away, not everyone stays for the whole message, or when the message finishes, there's a believer standing by ready to say, well, what did you think to what my friend was saying? Or to offer them a gospel leaflet and, and say, would you like to take this away to read for yourself? Uh, this is another one of the supporters in the open air, a lady called Sharon. Uh, this young man here was listening to me preach. And what happened is at the end um, of the uh, well, before I'd finished, in fact, he, he had to go. And so Sharon engaged this young man and, and talked to him about the gospel. Mm. And so that's a great way that both the preacher and the Christians who some of them may not be able to preach or uh, suitable to preach, but they can they can stand there and support that work, which is so helpful for, for the preacher. Um, today, there were so many listening. We just didn't have enough workers on the team to engage everyone and it's it's as a preacher you're seeing people walk away and you're thinking oh i i hope that they you know took the gospel with them that they heard enough when they were went through the preaching yeah yeah i mean it's 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 not not easy works folks i've been out there with joe a, a couple of times in fact we were out last week and joe was doing his talk on war as he just mentioned and there were a few people to begin with maybe stopping by having a listen and then um some people probably can't cope with hecklers. You did a good job, but one heckler came up, if you remember, Joe, and he started um, shouting about the war, and he obviously um, didn't like what we were saying. But by him heckling, he actually drew um, an even bigger crowd in to come and listen, and that gave us great opportunity um, to, to witness to other people, people who had never heard the gospel. And I remember, um, you'll know that, there was a few um, young girls there who – had, had never heard anything like this, they said, and there was a monk, a young Muslim chap who I went and talked with. And so although it can be difficult, it can be very rewarding um, in doing open air work. Mm, mm. Yeah. So, Joe, many Christians um, might be thinking, well, you know, if, if we if, from a UK perspective, I know people watching from all around the world. Um, it seems like a lot of Christians actually don't get involved in open air work there are very few churches maybe involved in it a few organizations involved in it why should christians be involved in open air work well i think we should start with our ultimate authority which is which is scripture um and as you mentioned earlier on simon there's multiple examples in the bible uh of of preaching in the open air the lord jesus did it peter did it Paul did it. In fact, it's harder to defend preaching indoors from scripture than it is to defend uh, preaching outdoors. There's so many e examples um, of that. Um, but looking at some of the reasoning of the Apostle Paul, you know, in Romans chapter 10, a very famous passage, um, Paul says, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
and how shall they hear without a preacher? Mm. Now we could say, well, I'm going to preach at my coffee morning or I'm going to preach in my church. And I'm for all forms of evangelism. I'm for preaching to a friend in a coffee shop. I'm for doing a Bible study one-to-one with people. I'm for every form of evangelism. And Christians should be friendly. Uh, that goes without saying. And Christians should make friends and share the gospel with their friends. Mm. But when I think about my circle of friends and then think about my circle of non-Christian friends, it's actually fairly small. I mean, I've only been working for Mission for two years. Before that, I worked in secular employment in uh, business management. But even then, my, my sphere of contacts was relatively small. And you think about the population of the UK, nearly 70 million people. And you think, well, if I only have maybe regular contact with 20 non-Christians, and even if I've shared the gospel with them all, and then you think about the population of of Bible-believing Christians in this country, and the same could be applied to the US or wherever you're watching from today, you realize that you're not going to really even scratch the surface of of sharing the gospel with the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. The reality is we need to go where people are. And we have to ask that question again. How are they going to hear without a preacher? And that's where open air evangelism comes into its own, because you're taking the gospel to where people are. So, you know, the first thing is it's, it's biblical to, to do this. Um, and, and, and secondly, it's, it's logical. As I've said, you just do the maths. Um, are we just going to let those people die without knowing about Christ? Are we just happy to say, well, that they're, they're not, they'll never come to our uh, to invitation to church. Well, so be it. That's the end of that for mm-hmm. them. Or are we going to say, well, we, they need to hear about Christ um, and we must go out and tell them. Um, so, you know, there's 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 two reasons. And, you know, one of the things that people often say is, um, it is well, we don't want to do it because it's not effective as a means of of outreach. Um, but I want to ask this question: What does what does that mean to be effective yeah. in evangelism? It, what Christ commissioned uh, the church to do is to preach the gospel to every creature, uh, to make disciples, to baptize them. Um, the first command there is to, is to go in, into all the world and preach the gospel. What we are called to be do is to do is to be faithful to the commands of of, of Christ, and, and to and to preach Christ to as many people as will listen to us as we tell them about the Lord Jesus. And if we measure effectiveness by how many people hear the gospel, then I just think today there were perhaps 30 to 40 people who heard something of the biblical gospel Mm -hmm. in the city of Nottingham today when we were out. And uh, I was talking to a friend recently in Derby. We did an open air together and he's done many church missions where he's, where he's been inviting people to to meetings in a church. And he said, you know, you'd spend all week, you know, inviting people, trying to get people to come and you'd get maybe two people in. And you'd be so happy to have those two people in under the sound of the gospel on our Lord's Day morning or evening service. But he said today in Derby, uh, we, you know, we reached 30 people with with the gospel. Mm. Um, and so if, if we measure it in that way, then it's a very effective means of evangelism. Now, there are uh, one of the privileges that I have in my role is that I'm partly also working in the office of the mission or supporting the administration management of the mission. And and so I get to hear some of the stories. I get the kind of 50,000 foot view down of what's going on in the UK and even other parts of the world. And I hear lovely stories of of people who've who've professed faith and come to Christ through um, open air work. Just in Derby last week, one of our team was speaking to a man. He came up to the team and said a couple of years ago uh, it was through first meeting you guys in the open air that I began a journey to, and I, I, I came to Christ. Um, sometimes we get people writing in from overseas who receive literature from us, um, an open air in, in this country and, and came to Christ. Um, I, I could reel off many, many stories. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, if if um, you, I know someone said there in Kansas, they're going to be doing it for the first time tomorrow. That's brilliant. It's good to hear uh, testimonies like that. And if you're watching tonight, and you want to get involved in open air evangelism, maybe you've never thought about doing this before, maybe your church has never thought about doing this before. If you want um, to know more, please do email the open air mission. We'll put their email on the screen. Um, There it is now. And email them, get in contact, ask them how you can get involved 
or how you can learn to do open air evangelism. This is such an important way uh, to reach people today. And if you are involved, then please do put a comment in and and let us know um, how you do that and where you are in the world um, sharing the gospel with people. So, Joe, we've we've talked about um, why we should do it, but people might be thinking, how should I do it? Is is there a, what is the approach to open air ev- evangelism? Is there a right way to do it? Is there a what wrong way to do it? Are there things we should do and things that we uh, should avoid when we go out onto the streets? If we say about right and wrong, we have to be careful because I think whilst the Bible teaches that open air evangelism is a biblical means of of outreach. It's not prescriptive in exactly how we should do it. It doesn't give us minute commands. And so we have to be careful, perhaps, about being over prescriptive. But perhaps it's helpful to think about it in categories of maybe wise and unwise ways of of preaching the gospel in the open air. And so there's a few examples that I can think of in my mind. And maybe there, if you're watching today, perhaps you can think of times that you've witnessed this as well of perhaps unwise ways of of preaching the gospel in, in the open air. And that might help us to point us in the direction of what's a helpful way to do it. So, um, I mean, one of one of the types of preacher that you may have come across is is the broken record preacher. And uh, what I mean by that is is someone who just goes on about one of the, the same particular topic. And, and sadly, today, um, one of the uh, topics that some open air preachers go on and on about is 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 particular sexual sins. Now, we, we believe uh, that God has ordained that sexual intimacy is for a man and a woman uh, in marriage for life. But what we, and we're not, we're not afraid to, to speak about the, the Bible's teaching on, on sexual ethics mm-hmm. in, in the open air. But there's a danger sometimes that some preachers just focus on these things and what they may do is get a crowd. They get might get a very big crowd. And I've seen examples of this where a big crowd have come. Uh, this person's preaching on uh, particular sexual sins and the crowd is getting very angry. And the preacher thinks it's some kind of badge of honor that they have got this angry crowd uh, throwing eggs at them or whatever. And they're kind of, look at me, I'm the martyr here. Um, but then they don't winsomely and graciously preach the gospel. And perhaps they get people just thinking about that particular sin and blind to all the other sin in their life. And so it just becomes uh, more damaging to the gospel um, than, than than helpful. So uh, try to avoid being a broken record preacher. We want to preach the, uh, about all kinds of all kinds of sin and warn against them. And, and but, but most importantly, we want to lead people to Christ and, and, and show by the way that we preach that we love people. And that we want them to come to receive the forgiveness that we've received as as sinful people as well. Um, another kind of preacher that you might come across in the open air. Sometimes it's unhelpful to to uh, when we see this is is the angry preacher. So sometimes uh, people are rightly burdened to preach the gospel in the open air, and and they go out and uh, and the way that they preach almost sounds like um, they are really angry at you and all they really want to do is is tell you you're going to hell and that's the end of it and that really doesn't communicate in in the in the way that that's done the the heart of god to sinners Mm -hmm. and so we want to try and avoid uh a preaching that lacks warmth and grace and tenderness Uh, we want to to preach in a way that's winsome uh, to the people who we're we're speaking to, and so uh, yeah, avoid avoid falling into the trap of being the 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 angry preacher. Um, I, I think perhaps I certainly started out perhaps falling to that trap as as a, as a young open air preacher, and maybe even still do. I don't know, but we need to be careful to guard against that. Mm. Um, there's another kind of preacher that sometimes uh, we see, and that's the dump truck preacher, and uh, that that's a that's a preacher who who just loads themselves up with biblical truth, reverses onto a city center or some other place and just dumps Bible truth on people, but without any real sensitivity to the fact that most people on the street have very little, if any, uh, knowledge of of the Bible's teaching. Mm -hmm. And so the dump truck preacher can be unhelpful because they might think they're preaching but they're not really engaging with people. They're just 
and they're just basically maybe shouting Bible verses or, or, or and, and I'm not against speaking the Bible in the open air. God saves through his word. But we are to open the scriptures, to expound the scriptures in our in our preaching in the open air and to expound them to people who know nothing about the Bible. And, and you'll know this, Simon, from your times with me. I'm always going back to the basics in yeah. my open air preaching. I'm always talking about creation. I'm always talking about the fact you have a creator. You're accountable because of that. You have a conscience. Uh, and those things I go on and on and on about because they are the foundation which Without that foundation, the gospel makes no sense. So um, don't be a dump truck preacher. Um, there's another kind of preacher as as well um, at, that you may have come across, which is the lone, rain, lo, lone ranger preacher. And uh, sometimes, uh, rightfully, again, people have a burden for preaching the gospel in the open air. And, and they go out and and they they start preaching in the open air maybe they've seen a video online or something and they they think I can do this but they're not sent or supported by a, a local church they're not under the eldership of, of their church uh, who have who've approved them to do that um and they they just go out and they're not sending people to to nearby churches as well they're just operating uh, uh, on their own as a lone ranger and, and that's that's just not not biblical. Um, we want to work with the local church under the authority of the local church. And we want to be connecting people and plugging them into to local churches um, when, when they listen to the to, to the gospel in the open air. So that they're four examples of perhaps unwise ways of preaching the gospel in, in, in the open air. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to define it, Joe. Really helpful for people if they're thinking about how to to go about open up. You certainly don't want to be a lone ranger preacher. It's so helpful to have other Christians out there who can keep you accountable um, to people, but also can help you share the gospel because you just cannot reach everyone by yourself. Um, we did have a question come in, and we'll try and answer this one. Maybe Diana uh, has just joined us, or she was thinking about something we said earlier. Joe, she asked this, how do you explain to those on the street that God does allow righteous wars? Now, maybe we don't, we won't get into to just war theory or what, when we can go to war, et cetera. But if we just ask that question, how do we explain? And I know you've done that today and last week when I was there. Um, how do you explain to people on the street um, about war and suffering? Yeah, Um and answering that question, how I answer that in public to a group of people may be very different in how I answer that in private to somebody who has just told me that they've had great suffering in, in their life. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, but when it comes to answering um, this question, and particularly on the subject of war, what, what I've done is, is, is given three biblical answers um, and the first one is is the reason that God allows war is is that God is patient. So I want to direct people back to the character of God, away from ourselves to the character of God. And I make the point that um, actually there's war going on, not just in Ukraine. There's war going on between husbands and wives, between parents and children, uh, between girlfriend and boyfriend, and and immediately people are thinking, yeah, that's me because I'm falling out. I've fallen out with this person in my life. Um, but then I, I'll also point out, actually, there's an even bigger war going on, and that's the fact that man is at war with God. That's what Psalm two says: man has set himself, arrayed himself against the Lord and against His anointed. And so I point out, actually, the the biggest war that's happening right now is that we're at war with God. And if God was to finish war, if God was to stop war and bring justice, he wouldn't just have to stop Putin and what's going on in Ukraine. He'd have to judge every single one of us and bring us to judgment. And so God is patient. That's why he hasn't stopped the war yet. That's why he allows it. He wants us to come to repentance. And of course, I point them to, to, to Peter, um, where that's uh, said by Peter. Um, I then talk about the fact that what else is God doing? Why else does he allow it? Well, God is speaking to us. Um, you know, if you've got a, a teenage uh, son or daughter, you know, in the, trying to wake them up in the morning. Uh, I, I've been told I've not got teenage children yet, but I've been told it can be very hard to wake them up. Sometimes a knock at the door is not enough. You need to maybe go in and say, wake up and, and, and pull the covers a bit. And, and in, in a sense, 
when when difficult things come in our lives, when 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 things happen on a national scale like that, it's God speaking very loudly. Prepare to meet your God. Mm. Uh, get ready because life is fragile, and perhaps that's something that the West in the West we've had very comfortable lives. Life life seems to be secure and easy, and then we see these things happening, and we're shaken. So I, I'm using that as an opportunity to say to people, look, life is fragile. You need to be. You need to realize that what happened in Ukraine could happen in this country, and death's going to come to you, however it comes to you. And you need to be ready to meet God. God is graciously and lovingly speaking, even through these disasters, to, to warn us and encourage us to seek Him. And then the other thing I've I've, I've say in that talk um, is is that God is 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 making peace, um, and He's made peace through the blood of His Son. And so that brings us on to the gospel and the fact that we can be reconciled with God. And once we're right with God. Then if God is for us, who can be against us? Uh, it's it's the wonder of the gospel that once we're on the side of God, once we're reconciled to God in Christ, then we don't need to fear anything, any war or any opposition, because God is working all things together for our good. So that's how I try and I'm always whenever I'm answering these questions, I don't just want to give a philosophical answer. I want to lead people to Christ yeah. in, in the way that I answer, particularly if we're in, a, we're in a crowd of people and someone throws out a question like that. I want to I'm realizing that. Whilst other people in the crowd might have that question, ultimately their need is is to hear about the Lord Jesus and how they can have their sins forgiven. Yeah, that's a great answer, Joe. And we've had a few more. Hopefully, Diana, that's helped you think about that. Um, we've had a few more comments come in. I can see, um, obviously, your wife's watching with us tonight, Joe, and she raises an important point. Tammy has said... Joe's wife, <laughs> don't worry, she's, she's not putting dirt out on you. She said, my <laughs> mum got saved through a leaflet she picked up off the ground that someone had discarded after receiving it. The Lord works in wonderful ways if we trust him and do what he commands. That's that's great because when we're up in the open air, your open air preaching, Joe, I know when I come out, um, we're handing out tracts all the time. And you don't know sometimes um, who those tracts will go to. I know in the church that I was in, in the UK, in St. Albans, that one of the elders of my church, his father was a barber and he got saved because someone, he was cutting his hair one day and when he left, he gave him a tract and he read it and he came to the Lord. The Lord works in wonderful ways. So it's great to be able to give um, people uh, literature when we're talking to them in the open air. There was one more question. We'll talk about this before. Oh, go on, Joe. Yeah. Can I just can I just give a little plug for a booklet? Um, the Mission produces a little booklet called Silent Messengers, which is about the vital ministry of gospel tracts. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I would, this uh, if you want a copy of this, just email the office, email at oamission.com, and we can also send you a pack, a sample pack of tracts for free. All of that's for free. Just get in contact. If you're in the UK, I'm afraid we can't send it further further than that. Um, but uh, yeah, get in contact with us. We'd love to send you one of these. And uh, we also do another booklet on um, personal evangelism. You can have a free copy of that as well um, if you if you get in contact with the office. So they're really helpful resources on on and in that actually there's some lovely uh, encouraging testimonies of people that were converted uh, through reading uh, gospel literature that was passed on to them. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, we've had we've had a few more questions. Obviously, a lot of people interested in this is really great. Janelle Lloyd Smith has asked, "How do you assess and choose the location in your town or community uh, in the open air preaching?" Well, one of the things that we're very blessed to have in the UK is that around thirty or forty years ago, a lot of town centres began to pedestrianise. And because of the history of the UK, it's a mar off, often market towns where there's central roads going in and a central area uh, it, that, that could be pedestrianised where there's no more traffic going through. So with all those pedestrianised areas, they present a wonderful place where we can stand and preach and there's, you're not going to get run over doing so. And uh, people are, are walking up and down those, those main streets in the towns. We're often looking for somewhere, because we don't use amplification, we want somewhere where if possible, there's some kind of buildings nearby just to help uh, work as a soundboard for our voice. We're looking for places where we're not going to be preaching into shops because whilst we want to engage people, we don't want to force people to listen against their will and uh, unnecessarily anger people by preaching into to shop doorways. So we try and look for sometimes an empty shop. Sadly, there's many empty shops at the moment in the in the UK. And we might stand outside that today. We were outside a, a bank that had closed down. 
and that presented a, a great opportunity to, to preach in that spot. But we're looking for places where there's good footfall, there's, an, there's a good number of people coming along, and uh, and where we're not also going to be an obstruction. We don't want to be blocking the road or blocking the, the, the path um, unnecessarily. I know it's different in other parts of the uh, the world with kind of grid systems in in in, uh, in other parts of the world. It's sometimes more difficult to find a a spot to preach. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, make sure you find a good spot where you're not troubling anyone. And um, if you've got a church behind you, then then do go for it. We've got another question, Joe, I saw come in. We've got a number of questions now. Um, Margie Young asked, when preparing to go out for open air evangelism, do you have a sort of loose outline to follow to keep from falling into the uh, aforementioned pitfalls? That's a, that's a great question. Um, yes, um, I mean, it varies from preacher to preacher, um, but for myself, I have a, um, a digital notebook and in there I've got all of my open air messages. Uh, I've got the ones that I've finished, ones I'm working on, ones that are just ideas. And I, I write down my outline. Often I write them out word for word to begin with when I'm planning a talk. I'll then create visual aids that, that match that and illustrate that. Sometimes it's just a Bible text, but I've still got a, a structure um, that I'm, I'm trying to work to when I'm, I'm preaching points that I'm drawing out from the text and making applications to the people that are listening to me or, or questions that I can throw out based on the based on the text. So, yeah, I always seek to have a, a, a structure. Now, often that changes and adapts when I'm preaching that talk because I'm out uh, three or four days a week. What I want to do is I'm, I'm often re repeating open air talks and I'll, I'll change them and swap them and put new illustrations in and um, really adapt them as necessary. You have to be very flexible in the open air. So, yeah, good to have structure in, in mind. But what you also need to do is be really flexible because you don't know if people are going to stop and listen. And if, if someone comes halfway through your talk and no one's listened to that point, there's no point just carrying on. You can always re rewind to the beginning or even say, well, here we are. Uh, I've just been talking about these three important truths and uh, now I'm going to explain this. And so you're engaging people rather than just kind of following your set plan. Yeah. Well, we've opened up the floodgate of questions. We get a lot of interest now from people, Joe. So um, we'll, we'll take some of these. We'll get some of these answered. Matthew Hobbs from Calvary Chapel uh, in Maidstone has asked, um, he's on the street tomorrow and he wants to know, basically, he'll be handing out tracks. Are the legal guidelines to observe or restrictions they need to be conscious of? Yeah, um, we are very grateful for the work of the Christian Institute here in the UK. Um, they have drafted a, a, a leaflet about uh, the law relating to street evangelism. So if you go, uh, I think it's Christian.org.uk, the Christian Institute website, you can go on there, download their uh, their their guidelines, which are helpful not only to to read before you go out for yourself, but to keep a copy with you just in case you are challenged in the open air. But the good news is, basically, if you're in a public place, i.e., it's not private land, part of a shopping mall or shopping centre, um, you generally speaking will have a right to preach uh, in in the open air, give out literature as long as you're reasonable. You're not blocking a thoroughfare or something like that. Um, so um, there, there are some excellent resources provided by the Christian Institute that you can you can read uh, to help guide with that. These are the kinds of things we sometimes run training days. We had one a couple of weeks ago. We had Sam Sam Webster, who's the in-house solicitor for the Christian Institute, and he provided some excellent uh, uh, slides um, for us uh, t t t talking through the issues of, of, the, of the law relating to free speech and street evangelism. So loads of support available for that. And I'm sure there's similar organizations in other parts of the world that can guide you because we do want to be wise in this and uh, and not create unnecessary difficulties with law enforcement when we're going out and preaching. Um, if we, that's often a distraction rather than a help to the gospel. Yeah. All right. We've got some more questions. Um, Pastor Ken, uh, I think he's writing under maybe his wife's tag tonight. Pastor Ken, uh, here again, how do you balance, balance answering questions from the crowd and not get distracted from your main message and purpose? That's a great question, Ken. How do you answer that one, Joe? Yeah, I think th there's two answers I'd give. One is that um, I don't mind getting distracted from the message because often the people that are listening are in, in, in the crowd. They may be listening to my talk. 
they don't they're they're more interested to hear my answer to that person's question who's just threw a question out to me from the crowd than they are to hearing my pre-prepared talk because everyone loves hearing a question and answer that's why you're watching this tonight isn't it it's one person asking questions to another it's it's interesting and so i don't mind getting sidetracked from my talk but what i do always want to do is is avoid getting sidetracked from the gospel mm. so if I can bring it back to my talk and use that as an illustration to answer the question, fine. But if I don't and I just end up preaching the gospel on the back of a question that's been asked, I don't mind. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, as long as the gospel is being preached and Christ is lifted up, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> great. That's a great way to answer it. And I'm going to keep taking There's some good questions. People are obviously interested in how to get involved in, in open air evangelism. We had a question from John Goodman. Uh, are questions good or bad in conversations when leafleting? I tend to ask, have you read the Bible? It leads on to bringing out the message of the Bible. What do you think about Christ and how he leads on? How would you answer that? I one? think that is a, is a great way of leafleting. Um, so some people, you know, just giving out a gospel tract, some believers find that scary. You know, we it's all you look odd. You know, you're standing there, you're giving out uh, leaflets. So that's understandable, but it is really helpful if you can go a step further and and ask uh, a question as you give it. And uh, one of the things the mission produces is gospel tracts, and they are all uh, titled with a question. So in fact, today, I think there, there might be a picture there of me speaking to three guys. I'm not sure I gave it to you or not, but the, I, I was, I was uh, standing by the board listening to the preacher, and uh, and there was... Um, I heard in my earshot three young men uh, looking at the sign that said free literature. And um, so you can see in that picture there, there's a book table. And on that book table, there's a sign that says free literature. And I was standing where the, the man in the, with the red arms is there, Roger. I was standing there and I heard these three guys, young guys. They said, oh, is it really free? Go on, go on, take some. Go on, go on, you should have one. And, and they didn't come in the end. And I, so I turned around and said, look, what would you like? You know, it's all free. So is it really free? I said, yeah. They said, oh, OK, I like, oh, I think I'll have one of those. And I said, look, I've got some on me. And I had a selection of gospel leaflets. And so I gave them one each. And one of them was, are you good enough to go to heaven? And I said, well, what do you think to that question? Are you good enough to go to heaven? And one of the guys said, you know, I don't think I am. I've done a lot of bad things in my life. This guy, only in his early 20s. And his mates kind of chuckled and nodded. Uh, and then we walked through the law of God. And we said, look, we're all guilty. Um, and, and we're all destined for, for judgment in hell. That's what we deserve. But then we talked about the work of Christ. It was only a brief conversation. Um, but that led on from just asking a question as I was giving this young man a, a gospel leaflet. So I think that's a, a great way. It takes a little bit of courage to ask that question. I don't always do it. I have to confess when I'm giving out leaflets. Um, but it, it's a good way to, to engage people. Yeah. Thank you so much, folks, for, for your questions. There's some really good questions there. I hope you're encouraged um, to get involved uh, either in handing out tracks or even in, engaged with your church in open air preaching. Well, I've got another question, Joe, um, before we, we move, as we move on. A lot of Christians actually seem reluctant to get involved in open air preaching. Why do you think um, that is? I've, I've often thought about this question. Um, and and that's because it is difficult to to get Christians to, to be involved in this work, to encourage them to do so. Um, I think one of the things is perhaps bad examples. You know, we've talked about some of those caricatures of preachers that people have in their mind. They think open air preaching. They think aggression, sandwich boards, shouting at people. And understandably, who wants to be doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, fair enough. So one of the... The, the, the things we want to do as a mission is 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 set an example of, of of how open air work can be done in a way which is not threatening or angry but is is winsome so i think um that's part of the part of the reason why why some christians are resistant to, to going out in the open air i think sometimes no having no example at all of open air work can also be um a, a bit of a, a hindrance if you're in a church where you know, there's there's just nobody does street evangelism. Um, 
you can it just might not even cross your mind that we that we need to do this and so um that that could be that could be a reason I, I think although i have to say if you've watched this tonight that can't be a reason now you know about this work so um but 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 really fear i think is a is a big is a big factor um when you Ooh. preach in a church building um what you're doing is uh, you've got a very controlled environment. You know, you've got people who, because it's not socially acceptable, aren't going to stand up and walk out. And they're not going to stand up and shout questions at you. I, I think you're wrong. Uh, you know, uh, go and get another job or something. Um, but in the open air, uh, anyone can ask you anything. Nobody's going to stop unless they're actually interested in what you're saying. And, and so what we find with, um, open air work is that sometimes people are just really afraid of that uncontrolled environment um but ultimately if we believe this is biblical and, and we trust in the in the living god there's no no reason to be to be afraid and uh you know i i i tremble before i go into the open air but actually what i'm trembling about and the more you do it you get you do get used to going to the open air but what i tremble about is is will i will i really be preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ as I ought to be preaching Christ in the open air. That's what makes me afraid. Am I going to be faithful in, in preaching the gospel? And I think it, it, it's good to focus on that um, rather than the, the fear of the, the fear of man. Um, it's natural to be afraid. It's natural to, to, to be afraid standing up preaching in front of people. But the Lord gives great grace with that. And so um, we, we can't let that be a reason to stop us going out and, and preaching preaching the gospel you know the apostle paul said the love of christ compels us mm. it, it drives us and we need to have that uh, that sense of the love of christ driving us to, to to preach the gospel to teach and and warn and and preach in season and um and out of season i think as well perhaps um it's seen as outdated you know, there's more trendy ways of, of doing evangelism now. And as I say, I'm not against any way of, of sharing the gospel. Um, if you're if you're if as long as you're teaching the true gospel to people, uh, salvation by faith in Christ alone, um, uh, then that's wonderful. But um, really, open air work is not outdated. If you're if you're able to go and talk to people about the gospel, um that's the same as it's always been. And, and praise God, in many Western nations, we still have this liberty to, to go and preach on the street. Now, there are brothers and sisters living in other parts of the world who look on with such envy that you and I can go and preach Christ in the open air. Mm. And actually, a day may come when God may withdraw that, that common grace blessing of free speech, and we're not going to be able to do this anymore. So really... Far from it being outdated, it's actually in date in that we don't know how long it's going to be till we get put in prison for preaching that Christ is the only way of salvation, that Christ requires us to turn from all manner of sins, uh, even sins that society says are good. You know, we don't know how long we're going to be able to do that. And uh, I, I fear that we might miss that opportunity. Um, so, yeah, that's why it's, it's definitely not outdated. Uh, but that's perhaps some of the reasons... Um, um, and what about you, Simon? What do you think? Uh, what have you come across? Uh, anything else? I, I think it's a, gr it's a it's a it's a great way uh, of sharing the gospel, and it's always in date, as you said. In fact, just oh, another question came in from Defender of the Truth, and we'll bring this up because I think this is maybe, and I don't think it's their attitude, but they did say street witnessing can be very discouraging. Honestly, there are not many ears to hear out there. Well, just think about the prophet. Isaiah, or Isaiah, if you're watching from America, um, God told him to go and preach to the people of Israel. And he said, no one is going to listen to you. But he told him to go and be faithful. And yeah, you can, I imagine Joe's had his discouraging days um, and it can be discouraging, but it can also be really encouraging. The few times I've been out with Joe um, since I've been here in Leicester, I've come back and I've been very encouraged telling my wife and the children what we've been up to and the conversations you've been able to have with people that you would never have been able to have if you were just sitting indoors on a, on a Saturday afternoon. So I think although people might say it's outdated, it's no longer got an effect, it's got a great effect. We just need to realize 
that, especially if you're living in the Western secular world, society has changed, but God, uh, God's ways have never changed. He, he ordains the means as well as the end, and he's ordained that we should go and preach the gospel to people. And yes, you can have some hard conversations, but you can have some great conversations with people, which maybe um, the Lord will use um, to bring people into his kingdom. Can I, can I just say, Simon, um, you brought something to mind there that actually the blessing of open air work isn't just for the unconverted people that we meet in the open air. The blessing is for the believers that that get involved in it. And, uh, you know, time and time again, I go into the open air, I might be discouraged, cast down. And occasionally, yeah, I leave cast down at the open air because very few people have been listening, as one of the uh, commenters have just said. But often I'm greatly helped by the Lord and and blessed in the conversation as I as even just restating the gospel to somebody again reminds me of the gospel and causes my heart to be warmed and to rejoice again in Christ and to meet people who are genuinely seeking. Um, there's one guy, uh, there's, a pic, uh, there's a picture of me speaking to a young guy today. Um, I won't give his name because I'm in regular contact with him, but he's come back three weeks in a row now. Young guy comes back on his lunch break speaks with me for 20, 30 minutes. He's, he was, he's asking question after question. And he just, if I give him an answer, he says, yeah, you know, that makes sense. Today, uh, we, we got talking about logic. And uh, he asked, well, what? how do you know the Bible's true? And I said, well, you're assuming truth and logic. And what's your basis for that? And, uh, and I, I pointed out that even by asking that question, the only way you can, for that question to make sense is if the Bible's true. And he said, yeah. Where does log where does logic fit into this? He said, I've got to go, but I'm gonna I've got an email drafted for you. I'm gonna send it to you. So that's just some an example of what an encouragement to see a young man who seems to be really seeking. And uh, you know, that's the blessing that you have when you, you do open air work. You meet these people, your own soul's encouraged. And also mm -hmm. it trains you to know your Bible better. I mean, how often I come away from an open air and I think, do you know what? I just I need to memorize more scripture. I need to to learn more systematic theology, you know, that the best, the best uh, preparation for street evangelism is not to know about every religion in the world um, and, and all the details of it, though it's helpful to know some of that truth, or some of that, uh, some of those things. But we, we, we need to just know our Bible really well and the, the doctrines of scripture. And uh, I often come away thinking, I wish I knew my Bible better. I need to get to know the Bible better. And then when we sit down at home, you know, you talked about the conversations you have at home, Simon, you know, we, I get home in an evening and often over dinner, I'm talking to my five-year-old daughter, Evie, and she'll say, Daddy, who did you speak to today? And I say, well, I met somebody and they believed that when you die, you become an animal. And she, really, Daddy? Now, what do we, what, why don't we believe that, Evie, from the Bible? And it's a lovely opportunity to talk to her and talk to our children about these things. So, yeah, there you go, folks. That's the way uh, to do it. Well, let's take, let's take one more question. And we may as well end with a controversial question. Um, but Eva's asked this question: Do you have women in your teams to speak to other women? But what what do we? So we'll expand upon that a bit, Joe. Um, do you have women preaching in the open air? Do you have women um, ladies in your team handing out tracts, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, we we don't have women preaching in the open air, and the reason for that is we do believe we're a complementarian organisation. We believe that God's given men and women different roles, although we're equal before God, and uh, because there are men gathered in the open air you're not in control of that um it wouldn't be appropriate for a lady to preach in our understanding of, of scripture um however uh it is essential to have ladies on the team it's not i mean we can get by but we we, we would i was just saying today to one of my colleagues and uh, dave i said to him dave we need to pray that god would send us another one we've got a, a lady on the team in nottingham and we really value the ladies that join us in in other parts of the uh the country that come out um but we long to have more ladies join us in the open air because as uh, the, the lady asked in this question, um, it's so valuable for a woman to speak to a woman mm. um, and, and have that connection and that uh, ability to talk in a way that a man and a woman sometimes is not appropriate or it's just not helpful. It's more helpful to have a woman speaking to a woman. So um, we, 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 some of the uh, greatest supporters of the open air work that I can think of are, are godly ladies who come out with us, some come on team events um, in different parts of the, the country and, and join us. And they are just such a blessing to the team. So if you're a lady watching this, you think, oh, it's not for me. I can't preach. We need people to stand in the crowd. 
We need people to engage with people. We need people to man the book table. If we've got a book table near the board, we need ladies uh, to give out gospel literature. Um, you know, we, there is there is definitely a place for you um, either in a local open air, in a local mm. city or, or at a team event if you if you wanted to come for one. Yeah. And there's even things that maybe we have to keep in mind that maybe not be culturally appropriate, because if you've got Muslim ladies in the community, um, as a man, you probably don't want to approach a Muslim lady because that will be culturally offensive to them. So that's why it's great to have uh, women, ladies in the team who can just go up and speak, converse with them about Christ and share the gospel. Um, wow, Joe, we've we've nearly got to the hour mark and we've had a load of questions come in. It's been really good. But be, before we close, Joe, why don't you just leave people with maybe a final thought if you want to leave them information about the Open Air Mission and let them know how they can contact you. Sure. I mean, one of the things I mentioned about the Open Air Mission is that we want to support the local church. We're not, although we're a, a parachurch organization, our, the committee who, who oversee the mission, many of them are, are local church pastors. We want to support the local church in doing evangelistic outreach. And I want to speak to anyone who's in a local church. Maybe you're a church leader. Maybe you're a member and you, you think we need to be reaching out to our community and we'd love to maybe try open air work, but we're not sure how we go about it. What I'd say is get in contact with us. If you're in the UK, we can arrange one of our evangelists to come and do a teach and go se- teach and go session to, to, to train uh, for a morning in the church with some uh, church members and church leaders and then go out in the open air and have a go um, at, at doing uh, open air evangelism. If you're further afield um, in other parts of the world where there aren't open air mission workers, um, still contact the office. Um, if you email, email at oamission.com, uh, we may be able to set up some kind of video training or be able to provide other um, resources. So I'd, I'd highly encourage you um, to do that. And if even if there's no open air work local to you in your area, um, we still do team events. And if you go on our website, um, there are opportunities to, to come on different team events. We run beach missions. So that's uh, a, a time of uh, a team coming to a beach resort in the UK, running children's work in the daytime and often open air or one-to-one evangelism in the evening as well. So there are loads of opportunities to get involved um, with the work of Open Air Mission. Um, But, you know, it doesn't have to be under the banner of the mission. Uh, We're passionate about open air work wherever it's done. And uh, we're hoping to publish a book in a few weeks' time that will be coming out um, on open air evangelism. So that will be available um, on our website as, as well. Great. Joe, thank you so much for for joining me tonight to discuss these things. I can see the comments that are coming in. A lot of questions have been asked by people. uh, So I think people have been encouraged, uplifted, and hopefully encouraged to maybe start getting involved in open air evangelism. Yeah, just to say, Simon, you know, if people have still got burning questions and, uh, you know, we're running out of time now, if if they want to just send an email, contact email at oamission.com. And it will come through and I'd be glad to help or pass it on to one of our other um, evangelists or one of my colleagues in the open air mission as well. Um, We'd love to support you in any way as you desire to to reach out with the gospel. Great. Well, Joe, thanks for thanks for being with me this evening. Thanks, Simon. God bless. Right. Folks, that was a great uh, conversation with Joe Bailey tonight from the open air mission. If you do have any interest in open air evangelism, and you're from the UK, please do contact the Open Air Mission. But if if you're from anywhere else in the world and you want to get involved um, in evangelism, you can contact us at Answers in Genesis and we'll try and put you in place and in touch with the right people. But most um, of all, hopefully what we've taken from tonight is that we should be out there sharing the gospel, the saving gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So please do try and get involved in some sort of evangelism because we need to be telling a lost world about um, our gracious saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Just so you know, next week we have, um, we're not going to be doing an interview. I've got my special guest, Dr. Nathaniel Jeanson, um, on with me, and he's going to be doing a talk on his brand new book, Traced, which has been dubbed the Rosetta Stone of human, hist- human history. So please do join me next week as Nathaniel will be giving a talk on that new book, and it'll be a fascinating talk and so 
with that in mind, um, I hope you all have a, a great uh, rest of the evening or whatever part of the world you're in, a great rest of the day and a great weekend, a great Lord's Day. And we'll see you back this time next week.